Hi guys, thank you for coming and welcome to Divox uh, 2019. So my name is uh, Mario Fusco. I uh, and there is Eduardo Vacchi with me and Maciej Zwiderski. We work uh, in Red Hat on the business automation team. Uh, and I'm the project lead of uh, Drus, the rule engine of, of Red Hat. Um, we are here to speak about uh, mainly these four things. So uh, we will give a quick introduction about our, let's say, old technology. We have uh, uh, Drus, which is our uh, rule engine, as I said, and JPPM, which is our uh, workflow engine. They are really good. Uh, well-established, uh, rock-solid technologies, but uh, they, they are 15 years old almost, and uh, we are keeping improving it, working on them, uh, improving the internal algorithm. So the core engine of both these uh, projects are very uh, valuable technologies, in my opinion, and uh, we will give a, a quick introduction about this. But uh, uh, the core of the part is that uh, how we evolved the these uh, technologies, uh, combine them to work it together in a, a more uh, um, consistent way. Uh, and um, uh, how we uh, created a, a, an even uh, uh, driven business automation uh, project. This is our new project that uh, we called uh, uh, Cogito. Again, it is, uh, 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 it is based on Drews and JBPM but uh, we rewrote uh, a relevant part of them uh, to, to make them uh, uh, cloud compliant and cloud, uh, cloud native. Uh, and uh, while doing this, uh, we also uh, leveraged uh, Quarkus, which is the new uh, lightweight framework of uh, Red Hat. To be more precise, we, you don't have, you, are not obliged to use Cogito in combination of, with Quarkus. We work uh, as well also with Spring Boot, for instance, if you prefer. But uh, with Quarkus, uh, we have a, a, a better integration uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, um, a more, uh, uh, a nicer uh, developer experience uh, with, with technologies like, uh, like Code Reload. And, uh, and the native compilation mode, uh, as we will demonstrate uh, in our demos. And finally, uh, we will demonstrate how we can put all this stuff on the cloud, namely the uh, Red Hat OpenShift cloud. But again, probably you can do the same also with other uh, sort of, uh, uh, with, with different vendors. Okay, so this is our agenda. This is uh, what we will talk about today. Uh, uh, and uh, so wh wh what is uh, business automation? Uh, as I said, uh, uh, it's mainly uh, composed of two uh, main uh, um, uh, parts. The workflow part is uh, where you define your business process. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the process of your, uh, of your company, how people uh, cooperate, uh, among them, uh, how they exchange information uh, till they uh, realize they, they reach the goal that uh, you want to achieve with this uh, workflow. Uh, and then uh, the other uh, part is the rules part, okay? So uh, if you think about <coughs> it, uh, business is made of rule, okay? You cannot easily describe uh, business uh, with a set of Java classes, but you can easily describe business with a set of rule uh, in the form of uh, uh, when, then. And this, is, uh, and this is what we do. This is uh, closer to the business, so it's easier to model uh, your uh, business rule with this sort of uh, language. And, uh, uh, and uh, it's easier to understand for business people uh, and validate uh, what business rule you encoded, okay? So, uh, as I said, I'm uh, the project lead of Drews. Uh, Drews is our, uh, 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 is our rule engine. And uh, uh, basically, uh, why you may want to use a rule engine? As I said, uh, because it's easier to model uh, your uh, uh, 
business rule uh, with a rule engine, with, with rule in, in the form of uh, uh, when uh, then uh, 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 rules, something like this, okay? Uh, and uh, so there are uh, lots, of, uh, lots of practical examples of this, for instance, uh, uh, there are lots of areas where, where uh, uh, people are using uh, rule engines and namely rules, for instance, for fraud detection. So people uh, uh, define the rule when you have uh, 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 found a fraud uh, uh, while using your, uh, 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 your credit card. And these are rules that, uh, that uh, uh, the business owner can validate, okay? Uh, and this is easier to maintain, easier to understand from the business. And the other uh, very interesting part is that in this way, you keep separated your uh, uh, business logic from uh, your, arch your architectural code. And this is uh, really important because uh, often the two things have a di completely different uh, life cycle. Probably, I don't know, if you work for a travel agency and uh, they are modeling the marketing rule uh, with, with, with the business rule, uh, very likely the marketing uh, will decide of having crazy rules and promotion and whatever uh, every day on every hour. So that part of code will change very often, while your architectural code uh, will change hopefully in years. So uh, they are two different scope, two different life cycle, and you want to keep them separated. Uh, and then the other nice thing of Drool is that uh, it provides you uh, um, a lot of uh, um, constraint, a lot of features for uh, temporal reasoning. So you can do even processing, you can correlate, correlate event using Drools. And uh, how generally a, a, a rule engine work and how do uh, Drews work in particular. So what Drews does is matching uh, your rule that are in the rule base uh, with uh, the fact that uh, you provide uh, to the engine while uh, you are executing the rule. So it matches the rule in the rule base with the fact that are, are in the working memory. Through that pattern matching engine, that pattern matching finds uh, the matches uh, between uh, the fact you provided and the rule. And for each uh, 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 match, it creates an activation and put it in the, into one agenda, okay? And then in the agenda, there is uh, this list of activation, the, this list of, of, of tuples, of rules that are ready to be fired. Uh, and each activation, as I say, is a tuple of the rule together with the set of facts that activated that rule. So you have this list of activation in the agenda, and uh, at that point you have a conflict resolution strategy, uh, which is also pluggable, uh, uh, where you can define uh, which rules has to be fired first, in which sequence this activation has to be fired, and then the rules are fired. Okay, so it's the, 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 the basics are pretty simple. And this is uh, uh, our uh, syntax, so uh, our rule is mainly made of two parts. Uh, uh, what we call the left-hand side part, the pattern matching part, is where uh, we describe uh, uh, the set of objects that, uh, uh, we, with which constraint we want to uh, uh, find uh, uh, the objects that are in the working memory and match them and combine them, okay? And uh, in the second part, the then part, uh, you can think about it uh, like a piece of Java code with a bit of, of syntax uh, that is specific of the rules. Uh, that is the um, firing part, the part that is uh, uh, executed when uh, uh, the activation is ready to be, to be fired. Uh, I just want to make you notice uh, here two things that are uh, quite relevant for the uh, last part of uh, this discussion. Uh, we uh, were used to use a lot of uh, reflection and dynamic class loader while evaluating this rule, okay? So in, in particular, we used a lot of uh, reflection in the left and uh, uh, side part. So if we need to figure out if, is, if the sprinkler is on or off, what we do? We have this uh, sprinkler pojo and we adjusted it uh, via reflection. So we used really a lot of reflection. And uh, in the same way, 
uh, to uh, trigger, to fire the consequence of the rule. What we did is that, okay, this is mostly Java code, as I said, so we have a preprocessor that translates uh, that code into a proper Java code, and then we took the Java code, put into a static method in a class, and we dynamic uh, uh, did the uh, loading of that class into our uh, class loader, okay? So, as I said, lots of reflection, lots of dynamic class loader. These two things doesn't play very well with the... Uh, uh, with the native compilation mode and uh, with the uh, not also not that really performant, uh, and this is the part that we rework it a lot, as we will uh, discuss later. And All right, uh, I have oh, yeah. a microphone. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the the second part is the workflow engine or the process engine, if you like. Uh, that's the JBPM project where I'm the project lead there. So what we're trying to put in kind of people's head that it's pretty much anything in any domain that can be expressed with processes and rules. As Mario said, the, the businesses are actually described by rules. And to make sure that we can, by, by doing that, we can actually start automating uh, our, our, our business in general and, and by that uh, remove uh, yeah, potential mistakes or repetition and, and th things like that. So we definitely wanted to emphasize that bringing in tools like uh, process engines or workflow engines can make your uh, implementation of the system way more visible to not only you as a developer, but as well to business stakeholders that can actually easily validate the, the business logic behind it. So JBPM is uh, a toolkit for business, uh, building business applications, uh, and it's been, as Mario said, for around for like 10, 15 years. Yeah, so 15 so, years. so it's, uh, we, we prefer to call it a mature framework rather than an old framework. But at the same time, it kind of, kind of <laughs> moved us towards a place where we, yeah, we need to find a way of modernize it to make sure that it still uh, is, is still va relevant or valid in in the new kind of a new era for Java, the native Java. So JBPM itself is is a tiny library that allows you to run uh, through a business processes that are uh, usually defined as a flowchart. And they could be expressed in a different formats like BPMN, that is the, one of the standard formats for uh, business process modeling uh, annotation. That defines not only the, the format itself, but the underlying uh, serialization in, in XML. And to some extent defines the uh, execution semantics too. But it's not the only thing that you can use to express your uh, business uh, processes. You can use the uh, CMMN for case management, or you can then use DMN for decision management and combine it with rules and, uh, and, and DRL. So the, the, the most simplistic case is just a flowchart that has a start and end events and a bunch of activities in between to actually uh, show what needs to happen to achieve that business goal. And that is called a, a structured process, so it has all activities connected with each other. But it's not the only thing that you can do. You can have an unstructured processes that are com composed of uh, process fragments. And there are like floating elements of, of different types that can be uh, in, uh, executed ad hoc and pretty much any time, at any time and as many times as you uh, need to do it. And looking at the different uh, aspects or different approaches to the business automation or business processes you usually go into a, a discussion between uh, orchestration and choreography and it's it, it, it's either going for uh, centralized or distributed approach so in the new world we have then pretty much the same discussions on the microservices patterns where we have the conductor pattern and reactor pattern and it's pretty much the same either you centralize things or you distribute things but what we're trying to push here to understand is that why not to use whatever actually fits your use case or even combine those two? Because it's not that you need, you need to select one or the other because, yeah, if you select orchestration, you cannot use the choreography. You can actually combine those two, and we'd like to show that in, in this uh, deep dive session, that you can take advantage of both. And by that, making sure that you can be uh, start being relevant in the new era where you start bringing in more and more into the uh, Java ecosystem. Eduardo? Okay, uh, so I am Eduardo, and uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, so w what we're actually here to, to see together, which is the new generation of our, uh, our platform, which is Cogito, business automation in the cloud. So what is this about? 
So uh, we sat at some point and decided that uh, we needed to change because the world around us was changing. So uh, there are new deployment techniques, new ways to use machine resources and to deploy our application. So in the past 15 years, uh, traditional way to deploy application was using application servers. But this, this started to change uh, in the last few years. Uh, you do not really use any more application servers, or at least <laughs> in the, uh, if you start over with a new project, you don't usually use it. An application server, you have these tinier web services, uh, web servers, uh, where you deploy one single application, and then you possibly deploy it in the cloud. So <laughs> you deploy it on some server uh, somewhere, and you do not really care where that server is, because it's managed by someone, that, so, someone else, and uh, uh, it, it might be scaled up, scaled down automatically. And this is what enables new use cases, such as serverless and function as a service, where you really do not care how many of those servers are there, how many instances of your application are running. You, you just use whatever uh, it's in place. And it also enables uh, cheaper um, expenses because, uh, because uh, the usage uh, will be uh, will be built depending on how much uh, your application requires those resources. So we sat and, and 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 wondered how we could fit in this new different landscape. So um, today we we talk about about the cloud. So what would it be? Uh, what would what, what would mean for us to become really so-called cloud native? What would it mean for our platform to be really something that uh, that's born and works great in the cloud, which does not mean that it won't work in the cloud, but what really uh, make a difference uh, if you plan uh, to to actually uh, use that platform in a in a so diverse and dynamic and uh, distributed environment? So. Um, the thing that we, the, that we came up with is something that has a faster boot time, a lower memory footprint, and it works great with all of these technologies, Quarkus, Kubernetes, OpenShift, and, and of course, Knative. Uh, you have a, a serverless environment. Uh, but as we, as we said, as Mario was saying before, uh, we're not really reduced to those. Uh, it works great with those, but if you don't want to use Quarkus, you're free to use Spring Boot. We support that as well. Uh, but we'll see in the, during this presentation that uh, wh why uh, we chose Quarkus as one of our primary uh, targets. Um, oh, a couple of words about the name. Uh, the name comes from Cogito, but of course spelled with a K because Kubernetes. And, uh, and, uh, and it comes from this Latin motto, uh, which is uh, attributed to Descartes. Cogito ergo sum, that is, uh, uh, I think, therefore, I exist, uh, which, of course, uh, um, plays uh, with the idea of uh, managing uh, business intelligence and knowledge. The, the pronunciation, we, uh, the canonical pronunciation, so to speak, it's cogito, like that. Uh, and, uh, but don't worry, if you don't get it right, nobody gets it right in our team, so it's okay. <laughs> and there's also at the bottom... Uh, a link uh, with a blog post that explains all the reasons and uh, for that. Another thing that uh, some people ask is about the logo. So uh, it's not Mario. Um, <laughs> it's not a pirate. It is actually a Viking and the one special Viking. It's uh, it's Odin, uh, the the goat, the Norse goat who sacrificed his eye for the gift of knowledge. Okay. So what is what is uh, what, what is it? What what do we do, and what does it have really uh, to do with our business automation platform? So uh, as I was saying, it, it's uh, it's rules and decision and processes and cases, um, but uh, that are meant to be run in a good way in a cloud environment. And so cloud native uh, execution and cloud native development under the covers. Uh, we, uh, that's, that's what Mario was especially uh, um, stressing. Um, the thing that we uh, really focused on was doing code generation and uh, compilation ahead of time of the business assets so that the startup time is really faster and the memory footprint is also can be, can be lowered. 
So the application will start much faster because uh, it doesn't have to do that much stuff because it was, did, it was done um, ahead of time. And uh, beside that, uh, what we also do, which is the most value that we bring there, it's that uh, you won't have to write that many code because most of the boilerplate we will take care about. So uh, we provide uh, rest endpoints automatically starting from your, from your business assets. Uh, you will be able to, to customize those to some extent, uh, but you don't really need to care about that if you're right with, the, with what we do. Um, yeah. And we also have a type safe data model to, 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 to call those into those uh, rest endpoints, of course. <coughs> Cogito Ergo Domain. So this is really one of the uh, of the keys, uh, the key aspects of this. Um, we really want you to focus on your on the problems that you have in your business domain, and don't care that much about the boilerplate and uh, and our platform. Our platform is born to serve the business and uh, to work with the business. So uh, you don't really uh, want to deal too much with the internals of our engines. What you really want to do is get stuff done. So uh, we want you to get stuff done and uh, provide you with an API which is relevant to the problem that you have to solve. So not much, uh, not much um, uh, we don't want to focus too much on the internals of our platform and give you something that really uh, speaks to you. Okay. Power, cogito ergo, power. What about power? What do we mean with power? So. Uh, we have a lot of faces here uh, to, to what we mean with power. Uh, first of all, we want to really focus on developer experience. We want to give you something that you as developers can use and have even fun using. Um, so uh, you, you will be able to use our tooling uh, to develop the processes and rules and decisions and care mostly only about that. For the rest, we will do code generation for you. And, uh, and because uh, we, we, we use Quarkus, uh, of course, again, we support Spring Boot, but if you do want to use Quarkus, you will be able to do hot code reload, live reload, and test your, your assets at runtime immediately in a snap right on your local machine. Cloud. So what about cloud? Because this is about this is what Cogito is uh, about. So uh, we design it so that it could run at scale. So uh, today, the the cloud is really where you, where, where your business application sh should live because there's a whole ecosystem of services you want to connect with, and that's why probably you want to be there as well. Um, we. We uh, work well, great in the cloud because we use uh, Quarkus, for instance, uh, to have a low memory footprint. We do code generation to have low memory footprint, low startup time. And of course, uh, we provide tooling to work well on Kubernetes and OpenShift and of course, Knative. A couple words about Quarkus, since I mentioned it quite a few times. Um, you will be able to, of course, uh, join a few sessions that will be uh, during DevX, uh, and so you'll know more about Quarkus uh, in those sessions, but I just want to give you a couple words about that, just to, 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 to give you an overview if you don't have already heard about it. It's a framework for writing in a runtime to write Last, lightweight and fast Java application. So what does it bring to the table? Well, uh, it does use code generation uh, to a very larger extent compared to other uh, web runtimes for Java. Uh, and, and it does so, so that uh, for, for, for mainly two reasons, to reduce startup time and memory footprint, even in JVM mode. And then the cherry on top is that uh, by doing so, it enables native compilation with GraalVM. So uh, native compilation is not really necessary to achieve lower memory footprint and, uh, uh, and, 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 and low startup time, but it will give you, uh, you know, a little bit of an edge on that. But you don't really need that uh, if you don't have extreme requirements. 
It exposes a whole lot of APIs you probably know already, so you don't have to relearn it. You already know what to do uh, with Quirkus because it's already using the APIs that you already uh, have learned. It comes with uh, quite a few extensions. So there's the Cogit extension, but there are Camel, uh, Vertex, and uh, RestEasy, Hibernate, and so on and so forth. Um, so you will be able to use all of these uh, great uh, libraries and uh, they will integrate very well with, uh, with Quirkus and especially with the hot code reloading part. So as I was saying, low memory footprint, faster startup, uh, Kubernetes native, but also live reload. We will see that in a couple minutes. And uh, this uh, is a diagram that shows you the blue bars show you uh, the JVM mode for Quarkus. And the red part is uh, other, other more traditional uh, Java frameworks. So as you can see, in JVM mode, it's already quite tiny compared to others. Uh, if you want, and if you have the right use case, uh, you could use native compilation, which lowers even, uh, even more uh, startup, startup time and uh, resource usages. It has uh, other drawbacks. You will learn about those uh, in other sessions. But you can choose. You have the freedom to choose which one you want to use. Um, so in a couple of minutes, uh, uh, we, will, we will do a, a live demo. And uh, if you have followed the instruction on Twitter that Mario shared a couple of days ago, uh, you will also be able to follow along and you will be given uh, some minutes to try uh, yourself. Uh, just a couple of words about hot reload. So if you do Maven compile then Quarkus column dev, uh, you will get hot reload. It means that you will be able to do changes in your code, refresh the web page and see those changes immediately without having to, to wait for another compilation step because it will do the compilation in the background and it really, really fast. And uh, what we did was plug into that mechanism so that our languages, because that's what they are basically, uh, the DRL is a rule language which is basically a form of programming languages, but also uh, the visual language that we use in, for JBPM and DMN, uh, those visual languages, uh, uh, you will be able to, to uh, update, make changes and reload at runtime and, and see the changes immediately for that mode. The demo we were, we were going to see, uh, it's, uh, it's the demo of a travel agency. This, this, this demo will, we will, will be our running example for the whole duration of this uh, three hours deep dive. Uh, with much A, you will see really, really uh, how to make uh, this application uh, a good citizen in, uh, in the OpenShift and uh, cloud native development. With me, uh, you'll just see uh, the local development part uh, and you'll see how it plays with a hot code reload. So, it's a travel handling service, so what does it do? Well, basically, uh, some, some person would like to book for a travel, uh, or would like to book a travel, so uh, it, 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 will book, uh, it will book hotels and it will book uh, flights. But also, in the, in the, during this process, you also have to check for visas, and, for, and, and you'll have to see if the person, if the, it's a citizen of some, of some country, uh, that requires some additional checks. So this is uh, what the process will do. What our, uh, what our uh, code generation will do will, will be generating code for uh, the REST API, and we have already set up a front end, gra a graphical front end for that, for the, a UI that you could use to uh, fill in the details. Uh, what we do is uh, generating all the rest endpoints, the UI you provided, but in this case, we did it for you. Okay, how to do that? So, I guess you probably have done it already, but just a couple of slides to the setup. So, you need VS Code to be installed, and uh, you need a Cogito extension, which is not right now on a marketplace because it's still, uh, because it's still um, a bit unstable. It's enough for quality right now, so we haven't released on the marketplace. But there's a one liner that you can use to download it. Or if you don't like to curl sh because it's not secure, uh, it's not. It's a, it's all right. We don't do anything strange. You can open that link and see it's nothing weird. But you can also download it manually from the Cogito tooling. Um, GitHub and install it manually. 
Then what we're going to do, uh, it's cloning this repository, github.com mswiderski slash devoxbe 2019, which is a, a repository that we have tried, uh, we have set up for these demos. Uh, and then you're going to cd into the first, uh, first demo. And then we're going we're gonna to play with it. So as you can see, I'm already in the right directory. So just to show you, here's all of the steps uh, that we will do uh, during our presentation, our deep dive. Uh, we will focus now on the first one. So in order to do uh, hot code reload, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write MF, uh, MBN compile Quarkus dev. All right. As you will see, uh, it's quite fast to start up. So this is the usual Maven setup, but now it will come up. There it is. And it's already listening to connection, for connection. So um, we have uh, also set up our, our application with Swagger UI. So you can see all of the endpoints that have been automatically generated for you. Okay, and this is the home page of our application. So this is uh, the, the, the UI is something that we have coded by hand, but these endpoints have been automatically uh, generated. So, okay. Okay, let me get back to Visual Studio Code, okay. So this is our process. It is a start, it is an end. You have seen that already with my chain, but let me give you a little more details how this, uh, how this works. So the first uh, node, it's a business rule task node. So in this node, well, there will be rules to execute, rules, rules. And uh, then uh, we, there, there's a choice there, it's so-called a gateway node. Um, depending on the result that we get from the rules, we decide whether uh, the person that applying for, for, for a travel uh, requires a visa or not. If it does require for a visa, we will require user intervention. That's the node at the, at the, at the top. Um, and uh, that person, which is a backup person probably, uh, will check the visa, the visa uh, manually and verify uh, the requirements are met. Um, if there no, there's no need for visa, then it will go straight to the next, uh, to the next phase, which is the one uh, where we actually book hotel and flight. And then at the end, the last user confirmation is for actually confirming the travel. A um, couple of words about uh, two nodes, book hotel and book flight, which are sub-processes. These sub-processes are really tiny, but the thing that I want you to see is that uh, the little cogs up there in that node means this is a web, it's a service, it's a service task. What's a service task? It's a task that can call into another service. In our case, uh, the code for those services, it's really, it's really tiny. Um, it's mocked up just for, <laughs> uh, just for this demo. But this is really Java code, and uh, this code you can write whatever you want. You can call into a REST service, whatever, it's your choice. Um, I also want to show you that uh, there's really little code here. Um, these are my open editors, we don't care about that. Uh, this is the code that we have in our source directory. It's just the data models, the service definitions, and then under resources, by, uh, uh, by convention, we put our assets, our rules, and our BPM under resources. As you can see, we have only these three, uh, four, uh, three processes and the, and the rules, and that's it. Okay, let's do a little, a little, a little dim of this. So let's try and book a travel. Okay, we have already filled in all the details, so we won't waste too much time doing that. So Jan Kowalski from uh, Poland is going to book a travel to New York, and that's the range updates, okay, this week. Uh, I'm gonna book a trip to this person, but then, as you can see, the visa is required. So the details here are, are empty, where there's no hotels, there's no flight, because uh, a user intervention is required. So we're stuck at this point here, 
um, in our in our we're stuck up there in our uh, check for visa task. Okay, so the back office person will have to check the documents and then confirm that the visa is fine. And so it will, they will uh, click the complete button. And as, as you can see, uh, the process has progressed. So it went to the other part of the execution and then it stopped at confirm travel. In fact, as you can see here, uh, the details are now all filled in and all it's, uh, that's required to do, it's uh, clicking the button for confirm travel, which is the task name here. I'm gonna click here, and then that's removed because it has been fulfilled. So let's try and do a couple small modifications that you could try on your machine as well. Um, we have here our business rules. As you can see, uh, we match against the trips and the travel, and the traveler, and uh, according to the nationality of the traveler and the, tr and, the, and, the, and the destination of the travel, we decide whether the visa is required or not. So if I'm Italian, the visa is not required. If I'm Polish, the visa is actually required if I go to the US. So what I'm gonna do here is change this to false. So the visa is not required anymore. Let's see uh, how the process change uh, if I do that. So what I'm going to do is refresh the page. Um, yeah, I'm going to refresh the page and it's already reloaded. If I switch to the My Console, you see uh, that something has occurred here. Change source files detected. It's not necessary that you actually read into that. But as you can see, it detected that the DRL file, the root file has changed, so it reloaded that. So let's see if I try to plan a new travel here and book it. The visa is not required now, and the details are now uh, complete. So it skipped entirely that because uh, I, I have changed and updated the, the business rules for that. And uh, now all that is uh, required is to complete this action. I could also do another change and see it, uh, how, how it's reflected immediately in my application. So for instance, suppose that I want to change the, the identifier that I use here uh, in the confirm travel node, and let's call it like travel confirmation, like this. This is a really stupid change, but just for the sake of showing you. Control S to save, and uh, save successfully. Okay, now I can reload, and uh, what we should see on my console is that uh, BPMN has been, has been uh, picked up, as you can see. And uh, so now I can uh, switch again here. You'll see that uh, if I book my trip, the visa is not required because the DRL has been changed. And as you will see here in task, the name is now travel confirmation, which has been picked up immediately automatically. Now I complete and it's filled out. Okay. okay. So let's switch back to this. So yeah, uh, one thing. Sorry. Yes. So out of curiosity, one of the tasks that we have is the demo history, but in reality, some of those tasks, like booking a flight, could yeah. take time. Yeah. You yes. might want to do this hopefully asynchronously. Yeah. Is it also possible to do it? Yes. Yes, yes. it is. Definitely. Yes, it is. We, we haven't showed it for uh, simplicity, but I think in the rest of the demo we'll see that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We will have a, another set of demos that will show the, the, uh, as the title of the presentation, the event-driven. So we start sending the events to, to communicate between services. Yep. Okay. Tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Eduardo, one thing that you didn't show is the execute the generation oh, of right, the right. model. Oh, right, right. Let me show so that. What is the file? So, yeah, uh, Eduardo showed you that... Uh, the code for this uh, demo is very uh, uh, tiny. Uh, you just need uh, basically the, the domain model and uh, rules and uh, process. Uh, uh, but that's also because uh, 
there is a lot of uh, code that is generated for under you the under code. the hood. Yeah. You, you are not writing it, but we generated uh, lots of code. So, so we, we don't want you to actually read that, but just yeah. to give you an idea, this is the kind of code that we generate yeah, for so, you. So uh, this is for the rules and uh, this is for the processes. This is all generated for you. You don't need to write this. This is done ahead of time to make the startup time faster and to pre-process all of the assets so that we don't have to do it at runtime. So yeah, just to hmm? just to to uh, okay. be uh, clear, uh, in the first part, I okay. I, I told you that uh, the rule evaluation used a lots of uh, um, reflection on the left hand side on the pattern matching evaluation side, and we did uh, you, we used class loader for what regards the the execution of the consequence. Uh, now we are not doing this anymore because uh, as you can see, we are all gener we are generating the code uh, uh, representing the rule. This is a, a, a Java DSL that is uh, uh, implemented inside rules, but uh, as, as Eduardo said, uh, you don't need to write this stuff. It's automatically generated for you, but I wanted to show you how uh, we uh, did overcome the um, uh, excessive use of reflection and uh, b and uh, dynamic class loading, because now the um, the uh, uh, constraint are evaluated uh, with lambda. This one, for instance, and the consequence uh, the consequence here is uh, is another lambda here. So. Uh, e e it, it's, it is just uh, 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 Java code now. There is no magic trick. The only magic trick, if you want, is that uh, we code generated, but uh, we do this uh, uh, inter entirely uh, ahead of time, okay? So uh, why I'm, I'm telling you so? Because uh, uh, the idea of both Quarkus and Cogito is doing uh, 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 at compile time, ahead of time, at building time, what uh, we did before at runtime, okay? Mm -hmm. So before at runtime, uh, we used uh, tons of reflection. We did, uh, uh, we did a lot of stuff, actually. We also, uh, w w when your uh, 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 jar containing the, the rule file uh, was uh, uh, um, loaded uh, into the a web server or into Cogito, into Quarkus. Uh, we had to parse the DRL to figure out uh, what's written on it and generate the uh, internal structure of the uh, rule engine, uh, the, what is called the, the reading network. And then uh, we, we uh, can finally evaluate the rules and uh, we can evaluate the rules, as I said, by using tons of reflection. And, and then we did the, the dynamic class loading of the code implementing the consequences. Uh, and and the, ev all this stuff was done at runtime, okay? Uh, and we figured out that uh, we don't need to do this. Uh, I mean, we need to do something like this, but it doesn't have to be a runtime. So our philosophy now is to move as much as possible at compile time. and. and and this means that at compile time, we are generating the, those classes that uh, is, uh, we call the executable model of a rule because it's actually uh, a, a, a pure Java representation of a rule that is immediately executable from the rule, the, from the rule engine. Uh, and, and, uh, and for processes and, uh, as well. Sorry? And for processes. And for processes, we did exactly the same thing, yes. Uh, so uh, we we can do uh, uh, all this stuff at compile time now. And by using uh, Quarkus, uh, we have also uh, a lot of other uh, goodies because uh, uh, with this uh, ahead of time uh, compilation, uh, there are lots of optimization that uh, normally are done by uh, the hotspot uh, again at runtime when your uh, Java application is running. Now uh, also Quarkus are, are doing this stuff at compile time. For instance, uh, that code elimination. Think about uh, how many, it's, it's not that code, uh, it's not your code that is dead. Okay, but it's mostly the code of the library that uh, you import in your project. Okay, this is 
very common. You uh, need to use a library, you add it to your POM file, you import it in your project, uh, and yeah, you actually to use uh, that library, but in reality, you use the 10% of the library, uh, and uh, you don't need the remaining uh, 90%. That, that is that code for you. That is that code for your application. That is code that you don't want to stay in memory, that, that you don't want to load, okay? So this that code elimination, again, can be done at, at, at compile time. At, at this uh, pace, uh, uh, in terms, both in terms of startup time, your application is, is faster uh, to start. And also, of course, it pays in terms of memory occupation. The, the footprint of your, uh, of your uh, application is much lower in this way. Uh, so, uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, regarding rules, uh, we did this uh, uh, Java representation of the rules, which is called, uh, which we called the executable model. And uh, in reality, we started doing this for a totally different reason. Uh, we wanted a, a way, a, a pure Java way to represent the rule, uh, a canonical Java representation of the rule. Okay, and uh, and in this way. Uh, when when your jar starts, uh, it cannot. Uh, uh, it can. Uh, the, the, you don't have to pass the DRL from scratch again. You can just interpret the the Java DSL, so you have a faster boot. Uh, the other reason why we did this is that uh, it improved the, the, our backward and forward compatibility because what we did before uh, is uh, uh, to, to 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 persist. Uh, a, a set of rule, a rule base. We uh, persisted the the, the, uh, the, the the rule base through serialization. So we serialized the rule base, and you know how good serialization is uh, is in Java, right? Uh, what what we do now, we don't know, we don't need to do this anymore. The 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 the, the Java rep the, the representation of the rule base is no longer a serialized rule base. It's this Java representation. This is enough for us. So this improved a lot our uh, uh, backward compatibility. And the other reason why we did this is that uh, uh, it allowed us for fast prototyping of a uh, new feature. Because if I wanted to add a feature to the rule engine, what I had to do before, I had to write uh, the, to define the syntax in, the, in the, our language in the DRL, and then I had to parse the syntax, and finally, uh, I can use the resulting of that uh, parsing inside the engine. Now I can just create uh, that feature in my uh, Java DSL, uh, without uh, any specific parsing, it's just uh, one more Java method in our DSL. And uh, when we are up, when we are happy with the feature, uh, we can decide yes, I want to make this feature available uh, to, to to users. And only at that point we create uh, the corresponding DRL syntax for that features. Uh, so yeah, uh, so uh, this is the reason why. Uh, we did the executable model, but then we figured out that uh, uh, this allowed us yeah, to avoid reflection, to avoid dynamic class loader. We figured out that uh, it allowed us to have a uh, faster uh, startup time. And even more important, we figured out uh, that uh, it allowed us also to have native compilation. Because uh, I, as I will discuss uh, uh, at the end, to have a native compilation with Quarkus and, and with GraalVM in reality, uh, you have some uh, constraint. There are some uh, things of Java that you cannot use. Namely, the, the two biggest ones are reflection and dynamic class loader. So the use of this executable model was also an enabler for us to starting uh, uh, having native compilation of our stuff, okay? And uh, if you want to know uh, more about uh, uh, this process, uh, uh, what we have done to uh, uh, move from uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the DRL to the executable model and uh, the, the, the technique we applied to uh, 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 perform this process, 
You can come to Eduardo's uh, 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 talk on uh, Wednesday uh, um, at 12 in room 9. Okay. If you come, you will also learn how to actually use this technique, which is not so complicated, actually. It is not at all, to, to apply it to many other kind of programs uh, that you may actually be writing in your everyday experience. So if you're interested, it's, uh, it's not rocket science at all. And um, you, know, you will learn something, maybe. <laughs> okay, pitch done. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, uh, the so as I said, the the, the native modes. It's uh, when you uh, natively compile your uh, Java application. It has some uh, trade-offs. So. Uh, what Eduardo did before uh, during our demo is that uh, uh, he started uh, Quarkus in the mode, and uh, in this way you have uh, auto reload capabilities, which are super nice if you are in the process of de defining uh, your uh, business uh, automation uh, rules and processes. Uh, but then, uh, of course, you don't want to go in production in the mode, uh, so. Uh, the trade-off is that uh, uh, with, with native mode, you can uh, create a, a native executable of your, uh, uh, of your application. Of course, you lose the, the auto load, but you are not interested in it in, at that point. Uh, and uh, it pays off with uh, 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 a very uh, faster, extremely faster startup time. Okay, why? Because uh, you don't have any more the overhead of starting the Java virtual machine on one side, and the other side because uh, both Quarkus and Cogito, as I said, have, have been engineering, engineered to uh, move at compile time the biggest part of the work. Okay, so you already have. Uh, these uh, advantages if you run in plain Java mode and you can, and it makes sense in many cases, we will discuss it this later. Uh, so you have already a lot uh, of uh, advantages uh, regarding the startup time because how Quarkus is written, how Cogito is written, okay? But uh, if you want, if you need even more, um, you can, uh, uh, natively compile your application and this eliminate totally the uh, the overhead of the Java virtual machine. Okay, um, and this uh, native compilation is based on uh, what is called the, the closed world optimization. So, how many of you have heard about uh, Graal or, or or the principle on which Graal is based, which is the closed world optimization? Okay, just a few. Okay. Closer world optimization, it means that uh, to do this stuff, the compiler has to reason on a closed world, okay? It has to know at compile time what's going on in your application. If you do a lot of reflection, uh, the compiler has no clue or what he should optimize, which are the, 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 the dead branches of your code. Um, and 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 it, it give up. So you cannot create a native image out of it. Even worse if you do dynamic class loader. So this is why uh, reflection and dynamic class loader loading um, are not good. Are not uh, compatible uh, with native mode because they break the cl this closer world uh, assumption. Okay. Uh, and the uh, other aspect is that uh, if you use this native mode, as I said, you, you don't want to only move the biggest part of the world at compile time. You will also remove the overhead of the Java virtual machine startup time. And this makes uh, totally sense if you want to run in a pure function as a service mode, okay? So in this mode, uh, you can think to a rule set as a function, okay? You have a function, but uh, in your case, for your business automation case, it's implemented with rule. 
and uh, you call the function and you want a result. This is very typical, okay? It's a, a stateless uh, usage of Druze, which is uh, very typical in many applications. And uh, in this way, you can deploy Druze in a, uh, or Cogito better in a, in a uh, function as a service environment because uh, uh, you don't have to pay the cost of bringing up a Java virtual machine and kill it at every invocation. There's no Java virtual machine, it's native code. And then uh, you can just create the, 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 the instance of uh, your rule evaluator on demand, evaluate the, your business rule, and, and then kill it. It's the pure function as a service paradigm. And uh, the native mode is an enabler for this. So we have a small demo. It's very small because it's so fast to start up, it will be <laughs> ending in a in a second. So we already pre-built pre an image because the native compilation takes a while, uh, but you will see that it's really worth it. It's up. <laughs> so yeah, as you can see. You can show the native image, uh, the runner file, if you, but this is something, again, uh, we are not doing this on stage because of what I say that the native compilation takes quite a lot. Probably, I, I don't know how much it takes on this machine, but probably a couple around of minutes, minutes, right? Around yeah, two, okay. Two and a half so anyway, we have heard doing this on stage. It's as easy as spelling out this. Uh, Maven, pack, Maven yes. package, dash p native, that's all. And uh, as you can see, the image you get, it's quite tiny. Uh, it's bigger than the jar, but it contains all the runtime. So it's about 46 megs. 46 megs, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, so it's exactly the same code. We didn't change a bit. You can run it uh, in uh, dev mode if you want uh, to interactively change it. You can run it in Java mode if you don't need the super fast uh, startup time. You can run it in native mode uh, if you need it. And uh, uh, there are some uh, trade-offs that uh, uh, I, I will discuss now. But uh, the point here is that uh, you can choose uh, in which way you want to use and deploy your application without changing a, a single line of code, okay? So uh, I was playing uh, with this stuff uh, uh, almost a year ago now, and uh, uh, I, I, I was keep playing uh, uh, with this during uh, the Christmas vacation last year, so <laughs> you can imagine how happy my wife uh, was at time. <laughs> but uh, I had uh, a, a working... Uh, uh, um, a first working prototype of Drews running in native mode on the 25th of December. So the, the Christmas evening, I sent uh, an email to uh, uh, my colleagues uh, with, uh, with this, this uh, screenshot of this is here for uh, historically reason mainly. But uh, I wanted to show uh, the advantages of running uh, Drews in native mode uh, uh, to my colleague at time and to you now. Um, so I'm evaluating a, a, a very uh, small uh, rule set, a very stupid set of rule, uh, but uh, I'm doing the same thing uh, in a plain Java mode, uh, running, uh, triggering the Java virtual machine on the left and in native mode on the right. So uh, if you can see the, ex the execution, in uh, Java mode took uh, 730 milliseconds, uh, Why? basically I had a sub-millisecond execution in, uh, in native mode. And also the memory occupation is quite interesting. Uh, in uh, one case, uh, I had uh, 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 103 megs of uh, memory and on the other side only 16 uh, megs of memory. So it's really probably yeah, 100 uh, times faster and uh, uh, tens time uh, less memory occupation. Uh, so it really pays off, okay? 
And then uh, uh, we did some benchmark. Actually, we did uh, some benchmark uh, with a customer who started using who has been one of our really early adopter uh, of our uh, technology. So uh, um, uh, we they wanted to, to use uh, uh, this technology in the uh, deployment mode that they said. So they wanted a function as a service rule engine. Okay. And, uh, and they started measuring uh, the startup time and the execution time of this thing with a more compelling uh, uh, set of rules. Basically, the set of rule, of, the real world set of rule in in their uh, up in the application that they already had uh, in production. So they did uh, uh, three uh, uh, implementation of this thing. Uh, one uh, with Turntail, and, and in reality two, one with Turntail and, and one with, with Quarkus. Uh, but Quark, uh, the Quarkus run, they tested it in two different ways, in native mode and in Java mode. So uh, this uh, uh, diagram is in log scale. And you can see that uh, Quarkus in Java mode is 10 times faster than, uh, than the uh, a turn tail uh, uh, um, um, application, equivalent application. And this is already, this is because uh, with Quarkus and Cogito, we are um, doing at, at compile time a lot of more stuff. But the real gain is when you uh, uh, do a native compilation of this, and you can see that, uh, uh, that uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, startup time takes four milliseconds in average. Uh, no, sorry, as minimum ten milliseconds in average. Uh, but this is a, a quite huge rule set, so it's, it, it, it totally is 100 times faster than the uh, Quarkus uh, Java mode, and uh, 1,000 times faster than the equivalent uh, uh, traditional uh, web service uh, serving this thing in the same way. And this is another uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, diagram, okay? Uh, so what we have here, uh, still this is in log scale. Uh, on the, on the Y uh, axis, you have the response time. And, uh, and on the uh, X axis, axis, you have the, the, the time, okay? So now you, they are not testing this thing anymore in, uh, uh, with a single uh, uh, invocation in a function as a service mode, they are letting the server running, okay, for some time. And, and this is very interesting what is happening here. The blue line is the uh, native execution, while the other two lines that mostly overlaps here I said this uh, is in long scale. The two, the two uh, are the Java virtual machine execution, both with uh, Quarkus and Tortail. But is the, the important part here is is that uh, it is Java versus native. Okay. So what you can see here is that uh, all the optimization are done ahead of time in native mode. So it starts super fast. But then all the optimization are there. It's, it cannot optimize anything else, okay? It is not optimizing anything else. So the execution is pretty flat during the whole life cycle of the application. On the other side, as you know, while uh, your Java application is running, the hotspot kicks in. Uh, it does uh, optimization like, uh, yeah, dead code elimination, um, branch prediction, uh, and inlining. Uh, as I said, all this stuff is done ahead of time by the, by the native compilation. But uh, as you can imagine, the hotspot uh, uh, can do this uh, uh, with uh, a, a bigger statistic uh, uh, relevancy of what he is doing. Uh, it is running the application, so at runtime, it can say, okay, statistically, this branch is not evaluated very often, so I can do a branch prediction here. And of course, uh, while running, 
uh, this thing for, for some time. At some point, the, the odd spot outperform the height of time, of, uh, the height of time uh, 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 optimization and compilation. And, and this is totally, uh, we had sort of expected this, but it has been very nice to see this uh, in action with proper, with proper uh, figures, okay? Uh, so this is uh, uh, one uh, application that, uh, uh, one customer application that uh, we tested with them. Um, last week, uh, we did another session of test uh, 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 for a different application. Uh, so, uh, sorry, about this, about this specific application, they are totally happy with this. They were, they are interested in having uh, the fast startup time for if they want to use it as a function, as a service, but also they are interested in, in this uh, flat uh, uh, response behavior during the life cycle of the application. So for this specific uh, application, uh, the customers say, okay, we are happy with the native mode, we will use the native mode, okay? And then as I said, last week uh, uh, I had another meeting with them, we test a different application, uh, the number of rules was uh, sort of uh, similar. Uh, the difference of this second application is that uh, it uh, uh, has to manage a lot more uh, objects, okay, a lot more facts. So uh, in, in, with this application, you have 10 or 15 facts on which the, the rule engine is reasoning. In that, uh, in the other application, for each invocation, we had about 4,000 uh, objects. And this makes a, a huge difference, okay? In, in, I don't have a slide for this, sorry. In reality, I'm not even uh, allowed to share those figures now, but uh, I can speak about it a bit. Uh, in, in, that, in that case, uh, we saw that uh, the native mode was behaving uh, pretty bad. Uh, why so? Uh, one of the other uh, uh, issue of, uh, of uh, the native mode is that uh, uh, the garbage collector is not uh, is not the uh, not super optimized. It is not well performing as the uh, garbage collector of the Java virtual machine. Okay, so uh, we saw that uh, we for that specific application. Uh, it had a uh, very long uh, full GC pose. And the, this was a problem, okay? So uh, they say, okay, for this application, for this web service, uh, we tested the native mode, we tested the Java virtual machine mode, and of course, so we cannot use the native mode in, with this use case because the, 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 the garbage collector is not performing good and uh, it is a blocker for us. So they said, okay, this is not a problem. For this application, we will speak to the Java virtual machine mode. Why I'm telling uh, you this? Just to say you that uh, it is a trade-off as everything in computer science. Uh, you have the good spot, the good part, the hot spot, the sweet spot for the uh, native mode, and also you have better situation for the Java virtual machine mode. So uh, what you can do uh, with this approach is that uh, you can measure the two different uh, uh, way of deploying your application and you can choose uh, without changing one single line of code which one fit the best for your your case, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is the nice, this is a very nice thing. This, uh, uh, it is a big, degree of freedom that you can use for your uh, uh, deployment choices. Okay, so uh, we want to make a, a pause, I guess, now, a little break. Uh, let's say we will start again at 11 in 20 minutes, and uh, uh, we will go through a bit more of the internal, the architecture of Cogito, but even more important, Mace will show you some more uh, uh, relevant demo, uh, uh, event-driven uh, demo, uh, as, uh, as uh, commented before. Thank you, and see you in 20 minutes. Thanks.
Okay. All right, uh, let's get started with the second part of the deep dive around Cogito and the event-driven business automation. So, so far we focused uh, mainly on the, like the introduction, on the, the basics of the uh, Cogito project itself. So now let's take a look a bit on the overall architecture because it's way more than just the runtime services, what we just uh, presented. So the demo that we showed, uh, uh, the rule engine, the process engine runs in, in uh, components or in services, or you can build up uh, applications out of them. But that is not just it's not just that. It, it can have way more components and they are uh, provisioned or deployed on demand. So depending on what are your needs and what are your services actually doing, you might have uh, equipped your uh, infrastructure with way more components. So since, it, since this is uh, targeting the cloud and targeting cloud at scale, we definitely need to have an, an operator. So that is running either in, in uh, right now in, in OpenShift, but we're targeting even in like, uh, Kubernetes environments as well. Uh, so it's responsible for managing the entire project with the Cogito, Cogito components of, in, inside them. So there might be obviously the runtime services that runs your rules, decisions, processes. Uh, and then it doesn't have to be just that. The, the Cogito, as we already explained, plays well with different frameworks like, like Quarkus or Spring Boot, so you can actually consider it as one of the capabilities of your service. So it's not only that you need to have the Cogito stuff in it, or like uh, rules or processes or decisions, you can put pretty much anything there. You can have a database access, you might have a transaction, you might have uh, integration with different uh, uh, infrastructure components like, such as Kafka or AMQ. So what we have here is that we want to take advantage of those things that already exist, and you most likely know them, uh, and to, to some extent start looking at how they actually can benefit uh, or how they can empower the business automation itself. So uh, we have the, the runtime services that are responsible for the actual runtime. So for evaluation of rules in case of uh, stateless services for uh, decisions or uh, stateless or stateful processes, so you might want to have that uh, distributed to a different respons uh, services that are responsible for different parts. So for instance, if we have a stateful process uh, service that requires to preserve the state, especially important when you have the kind of servers, uh, serverless uh, workload, where you want to just bring up the service, perform the work, and shut down, but at the same time, when the, the process is actually waiting for the input, and as, as soon as the input comes in, you would like to resume from the place where it stopped, even though the service went down because it was idle for, the, for a particular amount of time. So this is where we want to persist, persist the state of that particular invocation. And this is where we have the, uh, by default, InfiniSpan-based storage, or to make it a more generic, it's a key-value storage. So you can pretty much use any uh, key-value store for that. Uh, we, we use InfiniSpan to be able to put us in a cloud native environment, so we can scale that as well. Previously, with Jules and JBPM, our storage was relational database, which didn't scale that good or to the extent that we wanted to have it. But at the same time, we want to expose the information about the, what the runtime services are doing. So there are two uh, approaches to do that. Either you start exposing that kind of metrics out of the runtime services, and this is like a standard practice right now, so you can expose the information from the running service through uh, like Prometheus metrics endpoint that are then scrapped and uh, uh, visualized in different set of tools like, uh, like Grafana, for instance. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we can, uh, from the runtime services, uh, push out to the world different set of information. This is where we have this, this the first uh, part of the event-driven. The applications or the services, the runtimes of the of the Cogito project actually meet events. So they could be consumed by different uh, parties and uh, there might be different ways of sending those events, but the events that we are going to pr present today are going to use the Kafka as, uh, as the messaging infrastructure. So we simply push out Kafka messages about, uh, about the execution itself. So those can be consumed by our another component that is called Cogito Data Index. And this component is extremely important when it comes to the one of the main themes that Eduardo was mentioning, Cogito Ergo Domain. So each uh, project is built either from decisions or from uh, processes 
that kind of describe a particular domain. Like in our uh, demo here, we have the travel agency and the visas. So we have two business domains. One is maintaining the travel request and the other is the maintaining visa application. And th those are like a, the two distinct domains. Those information, whenever we process new travel requests and new visa application, emits events about the execution of, of, of what they've done, what is the context of it, and so on and so forth. This is what uh, the data index is responsible. So it's capturing those events and indexing them in a domain-specific way. So if you start talking to that, either to runtime services or to the, 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 the data index, you don't talk with process instances or process definitions or rules, agenda, uh, activation, and so forth. You don't really care what's behind it. What you really care is the actual domain. So if you want to look at the travel request, you look for travels. If you look at the visa application, you look for visa applications. If you want to filter it, great. You filter based on the domain information rather than the process behind it. But you don't want to search for process instances that deal with this particular visa application that actually uh, has uh, a traveler from Poland, for instance. You don't want to go through that way. You just want to find a visa application for people from Poland. That's it. Uh, again, everything is pushed out through a messaging infrastructure, but in this case Kafka, but it doesn't have to be. It's just a configuration of what you wanted to use as your messaging uh, transport layer. <coughs> So as we said, we, we want to be a cloud native, so, so we definitely want to uh, nicely fit into the, right now, the Kubernetes environment. So we have the operator. The operator is responsible for uh, maintaining the entire life cycle of the project. And the project is usually a set of components that you, uh, you've seen on the, on the previous slide, where you have, depending on what you really need, what your runtime services requires, the operator will be responsible for pro provisioning things on demand. So when, when you, once you create a project, it will make sure that you have all the infrastructure set up for you. If your project requires, excuse me, it requires, uh, for instance, a, a timers, so it's a distributed uh, the time tracking and then signaling, then it will definitely put another component in place. Okay, you need timers, we provision it on demand. If you don't need it, we scale it down, it's not, no longer needed or no longer consuming your resources. To make sure that we actually can do that, we have uh, the, the control kind of a guarding service to make sure that if you start depending uh, on different services, the operator tries to keep track of what is depending on, on what and to make sure that if you all of a sudden try to undeploy a service that is already used by another one, it will stop you from doing that. So at least you, you have some kind of control over not uh, you know, breaking your the entire project because you just removed one of the services that you thought is not being used anymore. Service disco discovery is again based on uh, Kubernetes information such as labels. So whenever we build a runtime service, either is that uh, based on processes, decision rules, we annotate the images and by that annotate all the uh, resources created by Kubernetes like the deployment config service or route with the labels that actually show what it brings in. So then you can simply use the Kubernetes API server to find out what services are actually providing particular capabilities. So for instance, if I want to call a service that is uh, through a direct invocation, like a REST call or, or similar, I can actually find the services in my namespace or in my uh, cluster that actually provide these capabilities. So I can search for a service that has a label for running a particular type of process and it's off type process or maybe some decision types and so on and so forth. So this is what gives us the opportunity to take advantage of the infrastructure to discover things uh, at runtime without much of a configuration in between. Uh, security provision and propagation, this is what we are looking at as well, to make sure that once you are deployed in the cloud, you are operating within a context of a, uh, of a realm. So you have a single place where you manage your users, groups, roles, and so on and so forth. Uh, every service that is provisioned by the operator will get that security information, so you get a special uh, service accounts that are... Uh, yeah allowed to communicate between the services. So again, kind of offloading you from uh, this, uh, this set of requirements uh, or non-functional requirements, so to say, for the service itself. As Mario mentioned, we, we started to work on the operator and the cloud infrastructure to be ready to run at scale. And that's why a certain choices have been done to make sure that we can uh, 
first of all, run at scale. So we have the, the like for instance, the data grid uh, or the key value store for a scalable uh, persistence or distributed components to be responsible for different parts of it. But at the same time, we wanted to make it easy to uh, to, to newcomers to uh, to know how to get uh, get their hands on it and how to try out uh, Cogito. So with that, we have a, a very simple uh, CLI tool that allows us to simply interact with the uh, under underlying uh, Cogito operator. So you don't have to, if you like, you can still use the operator kind of way. So you can create the resource files, the CRDs, and so on and so forth, and push that through the regular way of uh, applying changes to the Kubernetes cluster. But you could do that with a very simple uh, few uh, CLI commands that takes care of quite a few things that you, you don't have to really think about, especially when you start with it. So we have uh, like a main command that uh, allows us to create the project, which is uh, then creating the Kubernetes namespace and provisioning uh, services if they do need to be provisioned. Uh, or you can uh, directly deploy the service that is simply grabbing your source code and building the image uh, using the source to image on OpenShift to bring in the, the entire uh, running service uh, out of the source code. And the source code itself, as, as Eduardo mentioned, it could be the Quarkus application or uh, Spring Boot application. We have the Maven archetypes for those. Uh, whenever you use Quarkus, we definitely recommend you to simply use the, the Quarkus uh, way of uh, bootstrapping your application with this uh, selected set of uh, extensions where one of them is Cogito. But it's not the only way to deploy Cogito application. You can actually start with extremely simple stuff like I just have uh, my process definition or my rule definition or my decision definition. That's a single file. You can actually take a single file and use it for deploying as a service. So you can actually bring in uh, your business assets like processes, decisions, and rules to become a service without single line of code. So you can just put it there, design your process, push it through the uh, Cogito CLI and it will generate the project for you. It will run the uh, entire build. It creates the container image and deploys that uh, to your OpenShift cluster. So with that said, we'll try to deploy exact same uh, application, uh, a single service application, uh, the, the Cogito travel agency in OpenShift with using Cogito CLI. So let me just, just grab and explain what it actually is. So that is our Cogito CLI. Is it readable? I should make it slightly bigger. Let's put it like this again. So what it does, it creates uh, or deploys a new application called APP02. It gets it from the GitHub location. And the only thing that is an extra thing is to actually speed up the build. We have the, the local Maven cache in the OpenShift cluster. Uh, so it just shows where is the mirror to, to use instead of the Maven central. And that's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, and the SIG component is because it's a single uh, single repository, there are multiple uh, applications uh, there. So we just simply point, okay, this is the repository, this is the context, meaning the folder within that repository that we want to build. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> All right, so it started the build. It went into an OpenShift environment, so we can actually look at the build logs of it. Again, so what it does, it just grabs the source code, runs the Maven build on, on, on of it, then we'll start creating the images. It's based on the source to image. Uh, so there are two build, uh, two type of images in, in, uh, involved. One is the builder type of image which is responsible for exact thing what we can see on the screen. So it just grabs it, runs the Maven build, and by that downloading everything, and, and by that growing a lot, it has JDK, it has uh, Maven, it might have GraalVM as well if we need to have the native image. So all of a sudden, the, the result of that the process, it's rather big image. It's usually like six or 700 megs. So this is definitely not something that we want to push around the different environments and deploy. And that's why we have the chain builds, where as soon as the builder image is done, 
it will start a new build that will create the runtime image, which is just uh, what it actually requires to run. So if you're running in a native mode, it is just pure the uh, universal Bells image, which is uh, based on the Rail 8. Or if we are running in a JVM mode, like it will be done here, it actually runs with Java runtime environment only. So, it, so it's the, the UBI 8 plus the JRE and the jar file that we have here. That's it. That's uh, no, no, nothing else is actually required. So once that is done, the Cogito operator will grab that uh, image, provision it through the environments, make sure that it has all the components that it required, like deployment config with all the environment variables that it requires to have, with uh, service, with routes, exposing that to the outside world, and by that makes it available for consumption. So we have the build, the first build finished. And now we can use the other one. So if you look here on our OpenShift console. So the application is actually built and the should show up here. Yep, and we have it here. The rolling deployment has been done. We have the URL and exact same application. So it runs in exact same way, but uh, so we have the same set of information. So we can just uh, start the process and we get that in. So if we look quickly through the different aspects of it. So we, we did the build, we did it from source. Uh, there is uh, 100 and 80 megabytes of the image size, and it's not visible here. Uh, just see if that works. It should be visible now, yes. Mm -hmm. So again, it's much smaller than what we used to be with all the Maven uh, downloads, because it has quite a lot of things to download before it can actually start, uh, start building it. So that's why it's way smaller. When it comes to the native version of it, because you can have a native image based on it, so then you don't have the Java runtime environment, and the image, uh, the native image will be of around 40, 50 megabytes. Mm -hmm. So it, you end up with a container image of size approximately around 80 megabytes. So. We started to look at the, the what actually uh, Cogito is composed of. So the runtime service is the, the heart of it because this is where the process engine or the rule engine runs. Again, this might be seen as just one of the uh, capabilities of your server. You can bring in way more to that if you need to. You can integrate with, like we see in a minute, with the persistent storage. So this is InfiniSpan. So you need to have a way to talk to InfiniSpan. Everything that uh, we do, it's actually possible to run in a native image as well. So even interacting with InfiniSpan, with Kafka, with other services using HTTPS, SSL, and so on and so forth, is tested and is done to make sure that it can actually run in the native mode as well. So that enables the use case that Mario mentioned is the serverless, where you simply just scale up and down as needed. So you can scale uh, into like 100 instances at the same time because they start up in a couple of milliseconds and they can serve number of requests and then just simply shut down. So it's extremely small and lightweight, uh, but at the same time brings in quite a lot of capabilities already to make sure that you can start thinking about your business domain rather than the technicality behind it. One of the things that we usually bring up is that when we did the first implementation of first demos of, of Cogito, we, we, we built a service that was composed of three services. At first, all of them were written with processes. But since they were domain, uh, business domain uh, focused, they exposed the, the REST API uh, in the domain specific way. So you, you didn't have the process instances, you didn't have the uh, process definitions. And at some point, it was like, I think, three days before the demo, we decided, okay, <laughs> let's replace two of them with decisions and rules. Because then we can actually compose a more appealing story with all the pieces together. And we simply replaced the uh, internals of it, the replacing process with decision uh, table and process with uh, a set of DRLs. And all of a sudden, the, the REST API stayed exactly the same because the, it was dealing with exact same type of domain. 
So it didn't change at all, even though you changed the, uh, the implementation of the service. The service itself has uh, exactly the same capabilities when running on Quarkus or Spring Boot. Uh, so we do, again, we do the same stuff at build time, even from Spring Boot. So then the Spring Boot application actually starts quite fast as well. It's usually like around three seconds instead of what it was like seven or eight. Mm -hmm. Because we, again, we do that at build time. So whenever your Maven build runs, it will generate the code, it will optimize it, it will prepare everything for, uh, for the runtime to start much faster. And again, you can still take advantage of the frameworks you already use. So Infinispan you can use very well, in, uh, that is very well integrated with both Quarkus and Spring Boot, Apache Kafka, or AMQ, and everything else that you might need. Last but not least, it's definitely extendable. So we want to, for instance, if you don't want to use Infinispan for persistence, or maybe you don't want to use Kafka because you have already messaging infrastructure in place, you simply use that. Uh, what we send out through the messaging infrastructure is in format of cloud events. So we provide a, a standard kind of a payload uh, with the information for particular uh, activities that happened. But the overall frame of it or the envelope of it is cloud event based. So then you can use number of information in, in, the, uh, in the envelope itself to, to do the yeah, like message routing or uh, deciding if you really need that message or you might skip it and so on and so forth. So we do exactly the same uh, thing for, uh, within the uh, runtime services uh, to, to, to be able to communicate with each other. The persistence, as mentioned, that is definitely used for stateful processes. So and usually uh, business processes are kind of uh, long live. So you have a number of days, weeks, months, years, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you might start thinking, do I really need to have all processes, processes to be stateful? Because right now with the runtime that is moving you towards a smaller bits, uh, more distributed, you can start thinking about, okay, I can start decomposing my huge business process into smaller, we can call them microprocesses, and saying, okay, this particular set of processes because they are small and they perform exact same things all over again, they don't need to have persistence at all. They don't need to have this overhead, small but still an overhead, of persisting data because if it dies in the middle of execution, it will just be resumed and, ex and start from the beginning because it will just perform exact same steps. But for the situation where you do need to have per persistent uh, and a stored uh, state of your processes, we use the key value store where the, uh, it's extremely simple type, so it's a string and byte array, uh, where string is the identifier of the process, of process instance, and the byte is actually the state of it. And the state consists of a different type of information, so it has the information about the process instance itself and the active nodes, uh, plus the variables, the data that actually the process instance is dealing with. For all of that, we use protobuf to serialize. So now we don't have this problem with uh, Java serialization compatibility yeah. and so on. So it's not only the, the but beloved Java serialization. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So we moved away from it, and then obviously we need to f for protobuf we need to have the schema mm -hmm. uh, to be able to efficiently store that information. We need to have a, s a schema, and oh, we can have a, a predefined schema for what we know, right? So we know what the process instance is, what type of nodes it can have, and what type of information we need to store with it. So for that, we, we have uh, Cogito that brings in with that uh, protobuf scheme. But then for the process variables, the data that actually it deals with, we don't know this upfront. We only know that when you actually start building that. So if you build your processes, you define your variables. That variables become your domain uh, entity or domain uh, model. Based on that information, we can capture and introspect that and say, okay, this is what you have and we can prepare the proto schema for you based on the information you have in the project. Again, since we can introspect the entire process definition, we know what is your process variables, we know what types there are, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of protobuf schema we need to create. And since we use Infinispan, it's not only the protobuf schema that we need to have for it, we need to have the marshals for it. So we need to know how to grab your object, serialize it to bytes, and then back. So this is what we do at the build time as well. So as soon as you configure uh, persistence in your project, it becomes immediately uh, enabled for protobuster realization, and we then generate quite a lot of things for you 
to make sure that the protobuf can actually uh, work nicely and smoothly. So with that, what we actually deployed for the sake of the uh, saving time to not rerun the build again, what we deployed a couple of minutes ago, we actually deployed application that uses InfiniSpan as a persistence. So we created a simple travel agency, right? So we have the information, we have waiting for the visa application. And so if we go back here to our pod, and we simply delete it. So just operator found out, okay, we lost the pod. Let's start up a new one because we need to resume because the desired state is to have at least one running instance. So it immediately find it out because the pod was killed, or removed, we got a new one. So we got the new one since if we would be running in uh, without any persistence, our process instance would be gone because we didn't store it anyway. But since we did use the InfiniSpan storage, and now we find out if it actually works, <laughs> it's, it's still there, because it actually is in InfiniSpan. InfiniSpan pod is still running. It keeps all, the, all, all our data, and by that, we can resume at pretty much any time. We can shut down if you would run in a serverless manner, so it means that if it's not being used for a certain amount of time, it's being scaled down to zero. Bam, no instances, no resources used, but still the data is there. So as soon as a new request is coming, okay, I need to work with that particular travel request. It simply resumes from the place where it was. So if we simply go to task, we still have the visa application. We can simply complete it and just moves on. Like it was, if, if nothing happened, it just it stays there, it just restarts. As you could see, it's extremely fast restart even though this is not a native image this is a jvm mode but still within two three seconds we have a new pod one was killed the other was brought up and it's still running so it's all great we have the runtime service it preserves the restarts it can resume at pretty much any time but it's I said it's small, it's lightweight. And it's done like that because the runtime service itself does not give you any query capabilities. So you cannot just go to your travel agency service and say, give me all the requests that happened yesterday. It's simply not there because we don't keep that information. We just have a key value storage that says, okay, this is the running instances. I'm really responsible for running your travel request and nothing else. If you need more, then find someone else. And this is where we actually have the data index. So we distribute that responsibility to another service. This is where we, as soon as we create new requests, new travel requests, every that operation will send an event saying, okay, this is what happened. This is the se set of information I know about, meaning the process variables, this is the domain. So this is where we actually start having this information provision more and more. Once we have that information, we can start indexing that in a, again, domain-specific way. Because if we do have that, we can expose that for searches. And before I move on, let me just start the build of another project. So it runs while I'm talking. So let me see. We can just drop this one. Just clean it up a bit. You guys can talk while I'm doing, <laughs> so people are not bored. Well, I was just noticing that uh, by staying with Italian, you use gestures a lot, so you should be starting worrying <laughs> about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another example of what you can do. You can uh, clean up your environment with, again, Cogito CLI. And that was called A2. Bam. We remove everything. Uh, I will just show that after I start the second build. So that runs in the background. And if we quickly look here, what it starts right now, it starts the build uh, in a pod. 
but if you go back to our whole services, no app2 anymore. Everything related to that application has to be removed. Again, responsibility of the operator, it makes sure that it cleans up everything. You could do that with uh, the, the CLI, you could use a, a different set of tools like the operator API itself, or the CRDs and so on and so forth. You simply just remove the a particular set uh, uh, CRDs because it's again described as a, a custom resource in, in Kubernetes. But why not just using a single command so you don't have to deal with the details and what's behind it. In case something new comes in and all of a sudden your CRD is out of date because you stored it in your repository and so on and so forth, the new version of Cogito brings in new features. That helps a lot because you, you get just the, the CLI. Uh, in many cases, uh, it's a wrapper on top of the kube control or the OC client when it comes to OpenShift, but in many cases, it just adds on top of that. Uh, let me just quickly share. Okay, so as you can see here, we have one component deployed there, the Cogito data index. That's a single port right now, but it can scale. Uh, it's using again InfiniSpan underneath to store its index data. So similar as to our runtime, but it has a bit more sophisticated storage mechanism because it's not just storing key value storage. Yeah, it's a cache, right? It's a map base, but still we take advantage of InfiniSpan indexing capabilities. So you can then, based on the protofile information we have there, you can start indexing the data. And by indexing the data, you have a different caches. With the different caches, we use the InfiniSpan indexing based on Apache Lucene. So you can take advantage of that, of an extremely fast and flexible searches on top of that. With all that, we then have a configuration that uh, we have for it. And that's our protofiles. So we have a travels, that's the domain that defines a set of information we have. Again, as you can see, it's not like a, a simple type string, integers, floats and stuff like that. It's actually a complex type. And so you mentioned that those are automatically generated from the user files, right? Correct. So in, the dom in, in your project, you have those uh, Java beans or pojos. And based on that information, we generate a protofile with the annotation that are responsible for indexation. As soon as we deploy this project, guess what? We grab your project that was generated. We created a container image out of it. We have the protofiles there. Then the operator is actually responsible for extracting that information and pushing that to a data index config map. As soon as that ends up in the config map, the data index says, okay, I have a new domain defined. I can actually grab them, create the caches for them, and be ready for receiving events for them. Based on that information, you start receiving the events, they are being indexed and exposed to uh, searches. So let's see if our build is done. Yes, we have number three deployed. So if you just go here. Exact same thing. So the runtime service uses uh, InfiniSpan for the persistence and it sends events to data index. So data index has actually a quite interesting thing. Well, let's make it bigger. The interface of the data index is a GraphQL. So now you have, as soon as you deploy your domains, you start having a domain specific endpoints in your GraphQL schema. So you can then, again, refer to different things in the index. So you don't really care how it was done there. You have, a, for instance, a set of travels. So you get that information immediately there. And it's all done based on the schema. So for instance, this gives you the information about the domain, right? So this is the data types you defined in your process. It is immediately extracted based on the events that the, the, the runtime services emit, indexed by the data index service, exposed through it. So it gives you the full access to uh, find out a different set of information within your uh, domain. But at the same time, it is still keeping the reference between what actually 
was done for it. So if you want to look at the process instances behind that, you can actually look at that as well. So you can get the process, ident process instance identifier. You can look at the excuse me, process name, process ID, and maybe I would like to see what do we have else here? And root process ID. So that gives us a bit more information. So we know that there is a one process involved with the process ID travels and has no root process ID. So this gives you the, the, the hierarchical view of it. So if I go back to, sorry. I just close this one. If I just go back here and I just look at the visa application, complete this task. As Eduardo showed at first, the travel uh, process, whenever it uh, books the hotel and flight, it spins off a new process instances, new pro uh, uh, sub-processes responsible for getting that information. So now we can actually see them here. We have a still the travels one with the exact same ID, but then we have the flight booking and hotel booking. That already gives us information, okay, that has already been invoked. So we have multiple process instances uh, contributing to the same domain instance, or to the same, the same domain entity. And we know that they actually will spin off from the root process ID, that is the travels again. So we might want to see state of it as well, right? So to make sure that we know if they are still active or not. Since uh, the, the sub-processes are extremely simple, they just call the service, receive the information, and are done, we have them already completed. So the travel one, which is still active because it still waits on the confirmation from the traveler, is still an active one. And as you can see here, we don't have any visa applications because this process is extremely simple and it only allows you to just complete the visa application uh, user task and move on. Next step, we will have it actually the more complete environment where we start talking between the runtime services with events. And then this is where we start looking at a bit more advanced uh, usage of the processes and business automation in general. So the next steps to, should answer the question about having a uh, event-based and asynchronous communication across services, right? Correct, correct. And at the same time, because you can have that in different ways. Either you model it as an event-driven application, so you react to events and emit events, and this is what we show in a minute, or you can actually wrap it with the service invocation and then you have way more control over what happens. Because at some point you might have a more specific need on how the communication, how the events are built or how they are being transmitted. In case of Kafka, you might want to give it keys, not only the values, because we, we by default we send the values because we wanted to keep it agnostic from the transport. So the payload is cloud event with all the information. This is a, a value of the, of the Kafka message. But at some point, you, you might want to add a key to it to take advantage of a more specific Kafka uh, features. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is what we show quickly. Yeah, again, we try to use as much as we can things that are out there. So you don't have to learn, you don't have to, to find out what is the cogito way of doing particular things. We're trying to make sure that, yes, we have the persistence with Infinispan, we have the GraphQL that your clients can talk to, we have the Kafka and MQ for messaging, or uh, Prometheus for metrics. And again, this is what we wanted to expose uh, by default, the information that you get there in, from the engines themselves, right? So they're processing things, they can give you the information of what they actually been doing and so on and so forth. But at the same time, since we want to have it this ergo domain approach, so we want to be a domain specific, you have the a possibility to create extremely simple things like a few Java lines of code and expose your business domain into those metrics as well. We try to show the 
uh, the Grafana dashboard as well uh, when, when running the full uh, application. So it should give you the information that things that are on the left and right hand side, you have things that are provided by the engine itself. So this is like the statistics that we collect, the metrics we collect regardless. And the part in the middle where it's a visa approved and visa rejected is actually domain specific. Because this is nothing that the engines can be aware of without an extra information. Because this is a process variable or this is the domain data that you actually need to instruct the, the metrics uh, exported to actually show it. Because depending on the state of a particular variable, like this uh, uh, visa application, either it was approved or rejected. So without this information, you cannot have it domain specific. But at the same time, the, the code as a framework gives you this possibility to easily add that data to, uh, to, 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 to be exposed. So now we are going to this uh, more complete uh, Cogito Travel Agency, and that is built up of the two services. One service that is responsible for what we already seen, the travel agency, where we request uh, travels and then uh, optionally fill in the uh, visa application. And then the other one is actually responsible for dealing with those visa applications. So we have uh, different actors involved. So we have the traveler that is putting those requests. And then we have the visa uh, officer that looks at them uh, and either approves or rejects. And the third one, that is uh, sort of a, a travel assistant, who is taking advantage of what we build in the data index. So what we index, what we collect there, how we expose that information, they can filter out, look at the uh, dashboards, and so on and so forth. So let's uh, look at here. So we just shut down 03. And now we'll build. So now we need to talk about again. Stuff. <laughs> uh, so we build four. So we have uh, two services now. One that is the, the Cogito travel application. It uses, I, I actually show that in a minute. It's here. I can close, I can close this instance. And then go here. We go to number four. We start to build first. I already started one, so let's not stress my laptop. Okay, okay. <laughs> So you mentioned that uh, all of these demos are actually running in uh, JVM mode and not native mode. Correct. So even though even though we are not using native mode, uh, the startup time is uh, is really impressive. It, uh, you were mentioning that uh, when the cluster starts up, sometimes the application starts so fast that the other services are not running, like Hibernate or Kafka? Yeah, we, we definitely, if we start up with the uh, with Cogito application deployed, uh, and right now we don't have like a dependency between the deployments when they should start and so on. So we usually need to wait for both Infinispan and Kafka to start Finispan. up. Uh, they are both uh, based on oper operators as well, so they try to catch up, but most likely it will be less visible on the actual uh, cluster, uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes cluster that has a bit more resources than the laptop itself. Yeah, but uh, it's impressive. I mean, the, the, even though it's still uh, run, is, uh, running on JVM mode, uh, the Quarkus application is really, really fast to start up, so. Yeah, so what we have here, uh, that's a slightly modified version from what you've seen in the first one. Let me just hide this. Mm -hmm. And it shows a little bit more of an event-driven approach. So it starts exactly the same. So the traveler puts a request. It goes through the visa check if we need to have a visa or not. And yes, if we do need to have a visa, then we have the user task that is assigned to the traveler again to fill in a bit of information what is required to place this visa application. As soon as that is done, it sends an event saying, OK, this is the visa application done by this guy. He wants to travel to that place. And that is just sent out to a Kafka topic. Then it waits for another event. Either the visa has been approved or has been rejected, depending on what type of uh, action or what type of event uh, arrives. It either sends a notification over email that says, yeah, sorry, it was rejected, and we finished that. Or it was approved, and we go through the successful path for 
uh, booking, uh, flights and hotel. Let's see how our build is doing. I can see the fan is starting to be a bit noisy, so it's actually doing something. <laughs> All right, so we have the travel agency deployed. Let's deploy now the the visa application. So since we have the visa application, so let's take a look at what the visa application is doing. Uh, visas, linking code. look again at our resources there we have our processes it's become more and more noisy <laughs> and <dot. Yeah>. <laughs> not yet <laughs> so what it does here it's uh, quite easy to follow as well because it started not by a human interacting with the rest api actually the rest api that will be generated for this pro uh, process will not have an option to instantiate new process instances through a REST API. Because it says that only a message or an event can actually start this process. So with that information, it will only start when a message is on a particular topic. And it starts going through the automatic visa approval. So again, we have a set of rules that allows you to, if they uh, are met, then we don't have to do anything else. They are automatically approved. Thank you very much. We're sending the visa approved event. But if it's not, then we end up in a manual visa approval where the visa officer needs to go through the visa application and either approve it or reject it manually. And based on that outcome, we send the event. So looking here, sorry. Here are the visa rules, extremely simple. So if you're traveling to Australia uh, up to 90 days, it's automatically approved. And if you're traveling to US, it's uh, under 15 days, then it's automatically approved, which is not really the case for Polish people, but let's make it a, a, a happy path. And again, if you look at it, the source code has nothing related. This is the metrics definition only, so it's not relevant here, but it has no information about how to talk to the messaging infrastructure. The only thing you have here is that message It says that the message uses a visa application. And the visa application is actually the name of the topic. And since we don't specify here that's a Kafka topic or a maybe a JMSQ or anything else, this is where you start defining your information in the configuration things. So you have the visa application that says, okay, I'm going to use the uh, micro profile implementation for the reactive streams or reactive messaging, and I will use the Kafka here. So I specify what is the topic, and I will specify what is the serializes for the value, because I know that the value will hold some data. So I need to serialize that. And again, it's serialized from the cloud event, giving you not only the, the payload of the data itself, meaning the visa application, but it will also come with a set of information that are specific to Cogito, using the cloud events extensions, specifying a, a certain information like who actually created it, uh, process, instance, the f uh, process instance ID of the uh, requester and so on and so forth. This, this type of, inf uh, of information are relevant, especially for correlation of the events. So if we take a look here, so those end events, we would like to send them only with the information to a particular process instance that generates the request. Right? So we want to make sure that the visa application that has been processed will reach the travel request that generated this visa application. Okay, let's take a look at our build. I hope it's still 
app4 yes so we should have it there so we can uh, let me just close this one open our version 4 as you can see already reads the data from the data index so it already has it because we didn't clean clean up and then we have our visa application as well again a very sophisticated ui but at least it's a ui so now if we create a new one yes we have fill it in the same data so we just send it over we got it here as you can see there are no information I fill it in yet so we look at the visa and look there is a change we can apply for visa and another nice UI so you simply specify passport number and let's say we're going to US so we don't want to be automatically approved so we need to be above 15 so let's go 45 days in US if you like to do that you can see nothing happened here nothing no tasks but here we have a new request wait that's so small and you're not saying anything so we have the information about the visa here because it went through the process definition saying okay i received that message i got through the automatic approval none of the rules match because it's us and 45 days so it's exceed uh, 15 days so i can approve or reject as simple as that right so if i just approve it here another event was sent out that went to travel agency and it immediately got it approved we started to do the booking everything is just moving with the events and the interesting thing here is that this ui is actually now relying on the data index and the graphql all those things are based on GraphQL subscriptions. So as soon as the UI starts up, it sends the subscriptions to the data index service. Give me all the information with this information to show the travel and name, destination date, visa required, visa approved, hot and flight for travels updates only. So as soon as new travels comes into the data index, they will show up immediately here. That's why you, you could see that I'm not refreshing any views. As soon as I put the request, the view is automatically refreshed using the GraphQL subscriptions. And at the same time, you can make your runtime services to actually be serverless. Because all of a sudden, if they're not being used, you can shut down and your UI, because it's talking to the data index service to see the progress of, uh, of either visa application or travel request, they don't need to have the runtime service to be around unless you want, to perf you want to perform actions on it. And by mm -hmm. actions, you want to, for instance, work on the tasks, you want to approve or reject things, and so on. But if you just want to see, okay, give me the information that you have there, you don't really care where it is. You just want to fetch them, and you just want to fetch the information relevant to you. So it's not like if we would expose the same set of information in uh, via REST API, where we have a fixed set of data always pushed, right? So the data index has quite a lot of information. It's the domain, it has the process instance information, user task information, and so on and so forth. So with that, you would constantly get this huge payload, even though you just need to have five fields displayed. And this is where you can take advantage of GraphQL and define, okay, I just want to see those four fields, nothing more. Just give me that as soon as new things showed up, give me that. You can still you know, use the refresh pattern to, to, to refresh everything, but for the upcoming things that are being updated, they immediately show up here without any changes to your, uh, to your client application. And then let's take a look if our dashboards will show anything. Yes, we have something. Okay, not that visible. So this this is what we just done. It is again based on the Prometheus metrics that are taken from the runtime services. As soon as the, we do perform work, the metric will start showing information. All of them are exposed to the REST API. And the only thing you need to do is actually to make them 
configured in your application. We do the, the, the heavy lifting work, so we bring in all the information. We can extract statistics, we can push that information out to you. But at the same time, you can take already advantage of the information on the left and the right hand side and think what is actually being done. So services invoked. You can see that there was a book hotel and book flight and you have the information about the service itself. So it's already giving you a bit of a hint what happened in your run times. How many times, what rules have been applied Again, based on the information of your rules, your directives, and if you start naming them right, uh, right, uh, meaningful, so you can actually reason on, okay, what happened with the, because if you just say it, rule ABC, and then you have another DEF, that doesn't make you feel comfortable with the dashboards, right? Because then you say, okay, what now? I need to go into the rules mm -hmm. to actually find out what happened. Here, you directly have the information. And if you do run this another request and just go and apply, so you apply the same thing. Come on. No, it's too big. And like fifty five. Just go to approval and we just simply reject that. You get the information that it got. Uh, yeah, it's without visa approved now, no hotel flights, and it no options to continue with it. It just got uh, rejected, and by that you can't actually do anything anymore because it removed. And if we're lucky enough, or we are not should show up the visa rejected here as well. So you can see that the, the rules have been evaluated and now we have it. Hmm. It took a while because you know it's cloud so it has to travel <laughs> around different regions, <laughs> even at my laptop. Uh, but yes, so, so you have that information that is actually taken out from the domain specific information of your process, not the raw execution statistics. And if you like, you can have those uh, a nice uh, information about how much time it takes to execute rules. And if it's slow, then call Mario. <laughs> it's usually his fault. <laughs> <laughs> the processes are always fine <laughs> because it's mine fine. <laughs> but yeah, if uh, if you get any uh, information there, uh, you can actually start fine tuning what you want uh, to to see and how you want to see it. Uh, there's way more that you can start combining it with. You could definitely start combining with your actual statistic of the runtime service like the JVM statistics or maybe you have uh, uh, information about the uh, Kafka uh, producers and consumers and so on and so forth. So you can start building a different, uh, targeting different audience, a set of uh, dashboards where this and this is in my opinion one of the most important, especially from Cogito point of view, to be the domain specific to show you the information that it actually has a bit more than just the technology behind it. And you can swap it if you need it. You can replace it uh, with, uh, yeah, all of the signs say, okay, now I don't have that much, for instance, a need for business processes. I can actually switch it and have a very stateless camel route, for instance. Mm -hmm. Great, why not doing that? It, it, if it fits better, the use case, then you should definitely do that. That's the whole point, that you can start combining those uh, different technologies, different frameworks, to actually serve the purpose. Not always use the same tool, and not centralized, and not trying to make everything to be a, a huge black box that uh, you need to start putting every uh, everything there, or because you, I don't know, you just decided to use that, and you can't do anything else. And see where we are with slides. Yes, so now we'd like to open, we have still more, a bit more time, we still have a bit more content as well, but we wanted to open up for, for questions if you have any, and then, yeah, a bit of feedback on what's your thoughts about that. Any question? Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, there is, uh, and since I have a few Not more that minutes. Fast. Yeah, sorry, okay, yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, if you want more uh, uh, um, details about uh, this Cogito project, you 
can go at that uh, URL and uh, find more details. Yes. That's actually a good question. How to review uh, BPMN, to do code review for BPMN. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, th this is what we started to work as well. Right now what we showed is the VS Code extension. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I can show that, but let me try. Uh, so instead of just having the uh, VS Code where you need to download things in, we have uh, work, we started work on the Chrome extension. We can start visualizing things in, the, for instance, GitHub UI. So you can then start looking at the pull request and yep. start showing uh, side by side two forms of the process definition. Yep. So that is the approach we want to take. Obviously, it will not cover everything, especially things that are not visual at first, like uh, data assignments or mm -hmm. changes in the process variable names and so on and so forth. Yep. But at least the structure uh, type of information, you should already have being able to, to compare those two. Yeah, and the uh, tooling team is uh, also trying to come up with ideas to also visualize those parts that are not so immediate. But uh, yeah, from a GitHub repository, you should be able to do kind of a code review live using the vis visualization, actually concrete representation for the uh, BPMN files. Yeah, uh, let us show you if it works. Uh, <laughs> alpha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just to be on the safe alpha side. Quality. Yes. Just like the VS Code plugin right now, it's uh, alpha quality as well. But as you can see, yeah, we load up the file directly from, the, directly from uh, GitHub. Yeah. And it will show up right there. Yeah, so that, that is the, the pure visualization. Now we're going yeah. to work, uh, the, the team is already working on the uh, pull request support, so we can actually visualize both in a, in a split panel view. Yeah, There's a, yeah exactly. But it, it's, it's pretty much will look the same as you would see in the VS Code. Yeah. Uh, but it if gives you a bit more, uh, yeah information on top of that. In fact, in fact it's, the, it's, it's the same code base. Uh, it just changes the way it uh, loads in, in the page, but uh, basically. And just a note before uh, more people leave, we have a bonus track as well. So <laughs> you can stay, stick, stick around for a while more. Any other questions? Yes? So the question is about enterprise application, if there are any additional costs for this stuff. It's right now a community project, so yeah. there are no costs at all. So you can just grab it, use it as, as much as you want. Uh, later on, depending on the product marketing and, and product management things, it most likely will become at some point a product, and then there will be a, a subscription base as a any Yeah, in general, it's a, it's a usual uh, Red Dead uh, uh, subscription model. Subscription uh, uh, business. Support. All, all uh, our code is entirely open source. Yeah. You can grab it to use uh, for free. And uh, if you want subscription or support or, or, or uh, um, help, uh, in any way, uh, you will pay for it. Yeah, of course, there's always the Cogito mailing list where you get yeah, the community yeah, but support. Yes, uh, of, of course, so we, yeah. you, we inform, you, you don't have an SLA, but uh, of yeah. course you have support in our chat, in our uh, mailing list. So, yeah. uh, um, and and uh, by the way, if you start trying it, uh, we are super happy to have yeah. feedback to improve. Because we are still in our, especially well, in our in this this moment, which is still community effort. Yeah. We plan to have a release well, uh, every uh, month, every month, yeah. Yeah. three four weeks. Yes. So so we were we are very open to feedback. We really want to know from you uh, if it works, if you like it, if there's something you would like to see. Uh, so go ahead and try it and download it, play with it. We definitely don't want to hear that something doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so if we, it doesn't... We assume that it works, <laughs> unless we are proven wrong. So yes, we definitely w welcome yeah. any reproducers or anything. And w because since this is an, uh, like an evolution of draws and JVPM, but we don't want just simply forward port things that are right now in JVPM and draws. Yeah. It's more of the demand driven. So if we have yeah. a demand and... Obviously, demands are driven by requirements and use cases that, that we wanted to support. 
This is what actually drives uh, the Cogito forward. For instance, what we did for this demo, it was actually driven based on, the, on this event that, uh, approach that we wanted to improve because compared with V7, where we have to do a, quite a lot of integration code to yourself, to, for instance, talk to Kafka, use the cloud events and so on and so forth. This is what we've done a, a huge step forward in my opinion, just to push this that, yeah, you don't need to do that. You start just focusing on your business logic and say, okay, this is my domain model. This is the, the for instance, the visa application. So if someone applies for visa, I would like to be notified when the new, new visa application comes in. And I don't really care how it's done. If someone produces it, it might be the Koji to travel application, or maybe there is an, uh, a guy in an in a, a embassy that is filling in the form for someone and just sending out for uh, processing. So we don't really care. It might be different actors pushing those events, and then we simply interact with the same way. All the information on Get Started on the Cogito Key Org. You can find the mailing list, the people to uh, wh where we are, what we do. There is a, a very high level roadmap. Uh, we, we're targeting uh, a 1 0 release by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it won't cover everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be yeah, based on the feedback, based on the demands we ca collected so far. So, definitely encourage you to, to at least take a look, give it for a test drive. Uh, Share your feedback, share your demands, requirements, mm. what you would like to see it coming so, so we can definitely address that. Yeah, we don't want to do this stuff in our, our, our tower. We really need your feedback to, to know, well, mm. I need this feature, why it's not there. So any this, other, will, any this other is questions? the biggest help that you can give us at uh, this moment. Are there any other questions? There's one, yes. Yeah, yeah. you, yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, two questions. So the question is about migrating long-running processes from one version to another version of the process. Yes, there, there are multiple approaches to that. One is, as, is, as you mentioned, the migration itself. So you move data from one uh, definition to the other one. If that is uh, possible to be done because we don't have data changes that are incompatible there, you might do that. So it's migration between the two versions. Although the usual approach that we recommend is yeah, either uh, since we want to be a, a domain driven, so you can just grab the domain, put it into new process definition and just resume from the place that the domain says where it should be. So you then make it a more dynamic and more, more data driven than the flow driven. So that would be the more uh, simple use case for, for that. Uh, we, we have in, in, in JBPM right now the process instance migration, which we most likely will start moving as well to, to, to Cogito as well. But we wanted to move forward uh, with a more traditional way. So if you store the data, if you keep the data compatible, then the process definition is, is less relevant because you can just move the, uh, which node is actually active based on the data it, it, it deals with. There was uh, one last question out there. Yes. Yeah, you, you. Yes. Okay, so the question is about timers. So if we support timers, and what other kinds of event buses we support? Yeah, when it comes to the timer, yes, uh, we're looking at that. And this is what is actually right now uh, being uh, developed. So we have a similar to uh, data index service. We have a, a job service, a timer service that will be responsible for tracking of time. And based on the information, it will either create new instances or signal existing instances and so forth to resume the execution. So yes, we do support and we will support definitely. This is one of the most important requirements for uh, processes as well. When it comes to triggering by different uh, projects, products, messaging infrastructure, yes, we can. Right now, what we're relying on uh, when running in uh, Quarkus uh, mode, we're relying on the reactive messaging from the micro profile. So everything that is supported by that is supported automatically in Cogito. When it comes to running in Spring Boot, uh, it's more of what Spring Boot supports, we can support as well. Okay. Uh, I think we can 
go ahead with the move, bonus yeah. track. Yeah. So, uh, this bonus track is about uh, mainly Graal but mainly um, how we achieved the uh, uh, drills and, and JBPM to run in, in native mode, okay? So, uh, I guess the biggest part of you know about Graal VM or knows know what it is. So, yeah, it many. is a, a new uh, um, Oracle virtual ma machine. Uh, which is, of course, uh, compatible with Java, with the JVM, but it's also able to natively compile uh, lots of other ling languages and make uh, 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 um, optimization, cross-languages of the optimization. So what does this mean? This means yeah, one typical optimization, for instance, is that in Java, if you have a quite small method that is called by uh, many other methods, uh, the... Uh, call at me that is uh, inlined inside the colli, okay? So this is the typical inlining optimization that is done at runtime by the hotspot. Uh, as I said, Graal VM can do this ahead of time, but cannot not only this from a Java to Java call, but it can do it uh, cross language, which is pretty cool if you think about it. Uh, and the other thing the, that it was may, uh, more relevant for us is that it allows you to create uh, another uh, binary image out of your Java program, okay? Uh, and as I said, this uh, has a lot of uh, benefits and some drawback, but the main benefits are the faster uh, boot up time and the lower memory footprint. So uh, what GraalVM does uh, is uh, this ahead of time compilation uh, that is based on uh, static analysis of, of your code. And as I mentioned before, it's uh, based on this closed word assumption. Uh, this closed word assumption means that uh, ahead of time, uh, the native compiler needs to know uh, basically the path of your uh, program, what's happening inside your program. And if you use some uh, magic Java stuff like dynamic class loading and reflection, it doesn't work. So uh, uh, as I anticipated, uh, we use it a lot, the dynamic class loading. So basically why I'm going through this, because I want to show you uh, our journey, what we did to uh, make our uh, project to be compatible uh, with this technology. So you are aware of uh, what are the, the problem and the limitation of this technology, how we, you, we all, uh, overcome this uh, uh, problem, and maybe you may want to do the same for your project, okay? So uh, I, I said that uh, uh, you can do, uh, you cannot do at all dynamic class loading, uh, there are other limitations. You cannot use uh, Java Agent, so you cannot use, uh, for instance, stuff like Jerable on Byteman. You cannot use JMX, but JMX is mainly, is mainly uh, for uh, 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 not profiling, but monitoring right. your uh, your application. And, and uh, much already dem demonstrated it, how uh, you can achieve the same with, uh, with uh, um, Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, and then uh, you have limited support of reflection. What does it mean? It means that uh, uh, when you, uh, your project uh, use reflection, you shouldn't, uh, but if you really need, uh, you can tell to the GraalVM compiler, look, I'm using reflection on this specific uh, class. I'm putting the list of the class where I want to use reflection in this uh, JSON descriptor, and I... Uh, feed the, the um, uh, graal compiler with that flag uh, pointing to the JSON file containing the list uh, where uh, uh, of, of the classes where I want to use reflection. And we use uh, this trick a bit uh, in the in the past. Uh, now drools and JPPM are totally reflection free. We don't need to do this anymore. But we used the uh, district a bit in the past while we are moving toward the totally reflection free um, uh, uh, project. And I, I, I told you what was the, the main trick. The main trick was that uh, uh, we basically do uh, 
uh, code generation. We do code generation for the rules, for the uh, processes, so we don't need the dynamic class loading anymore. Now, uh, the, the, our uh, class loader just throw an exception if it is called, uh, if it's defined class is called. And uh, as, as I said, we uh, transformed our uh, uh, rules, our DRL files, and our uh, um, processes, BPMM files to native Java code, to plain Java code. And uh, we had to do uh, to to use exactly the same trick, also for other stuff. For instance, uh, we have uh, uh, we used to have an XML file. Well, we still have an XML file uh, where you describe the the, the, the configuration of uh, the knowledge bases and the uh, and the session that runs uh, um, inside the rules. Um, as I said, this is defined with an XML file, but guess what? The XML parser lost use uh, a lot of uh, reflection to materialize the XML file in your domain classes. So uh, we skipped it as well. So at, at compile time, still uh, we don't want to use reflection. So at compile time, we read that the XML file and translate it, it into the corresponding Java code, uh, 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 defining the configuration of Druze for this instance. And the last bit was that uh, uh, Druze is a modular, uh, modular uh, uh, rule engine. So it's made of different uh, parts. For instance, I don't know if you want to use decision table, you bring in the decision table module, and this uh, module will register on the core engine. And uh, each module has this uh, configuration file where it defines uh, uh, which kind of services it provides, which is basically defined by an interface uh, and uh, which implementation, which actual class is implementing that service which is defined by uh, a, a, a Java class. And what we did before is that uh, we uh, uh, did a class for name of that class that was the provider of the service, okay? And this, once again, is breaking the closed world assumption of Graal. So we, can, we couldn't use it so what we are doing is that is generating this thing where we have, uh, uh, which, is, which does exactly the same thing as before, but with a, a subtle difference. We did class for name of a variable where a variable was taken from the uh, uh, configuration file and, and this break the closed word assumption. Now we are generating a file that does class for name of a constant, okay? So since it is a constant, Graal knows what it is. I'm not breaking the closed world assumption anymore. And uh, this enables to have this uh, modular system also in native mood. Uh, and uh, these are all the changes that uh, we had to do inside Drew. So I, I told you, not totally related with the the rest of the talk I understand, but I think that it will be interesting for you uh, to figure out uh, how we approach the problem and uh, how we moved to uh, this uh, end of time uh, compilation uh, approach. And again, if you want to know more about this, go to Eduardo's talk uh, on Wednesday, uh, uh, 12 o'clock, and uh, he will explain a lot more about uh, uh, how we do we did to 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 follow this approach. Okay, and this is really all. So if you have more question, we are here. Uh, if uh, you want to talk with us, we are around. And uh, from tomorrow, we will be at our uh, Reddit booth. So feel free to come and uh, to catch up. Thank you. Thank you. No more question? Okay, great. Enjoy <laughs> the evox.